how you feeling today? <laughs> Great, man. This coffee, I don't know where you get it from, but it is rocket fuel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bustello <laughs> is that. what we do in this apartment. I've got That's like awesome. seven uh, empty Bustello cans all filled with uh, with coins. I was going to say, you either put coins in there or crayons or like some type of art supply. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I see that too, where people will plant their pots or <laughs> pot their plants with Bustello. Oh, yeah. Make That's like actually a, a sick idea. Make a Bustello uh, cabin. A cabin? Yeah, man. Or make some body armor out of Bustello cans. <laughs> yeah. On Halloween or something. Or sure. a LARPer. A LARPer is just like, I'm Don Quixote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when Dorothy lands in Oz next time, there's the Bustello Tin Man. <laughs> I love that. And he, it played by Lynn manuel Miranda. Oh, dude. Oh, I saw it in the Heights, by the way. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I hated it so much because I hate musicals. Sure. But, but it was like kind of cool, sort of. Yeah, so there's like love and hate. Yeah. You, know, I was like, you had love on one knuckle and hate on the other knuckle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, like a biker. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, no, it was interesting. It was cool. But um, the, there was a whole thing about how Lin-Manuel used mostly um, light-skinded Latinas, uh, Latinx people. We need to talk about colorism in the Latinx community. Yes. And so... Um, People were very pissed off about that. And where are the Afro-Latinos, Latinas, Latinx? Yeah. I get it, man. I mean, it's like he's never been to Washington Heights. Yeah. Many, many, many black Latinos. Latinos are black, dude. There's just, uh, you know, there there was the, the slave trade mm-hmm. uh, throughout the Caribbean. Uh, people don't even know that they're black people in Mexico, but, you know, through Ver- Veracruz was uh, one of the main hubs for the trans-Atlantic slave trade as well. So I had no huge idea. Huge population. And anybody that's interested in that can just watch uh, Black in Latin America, which I brought up on another episode, but the Henry uh, Skip Gates documentary series. Absolutely. And also Gustavo Fring character from <laughs> Breaking Bad is um, yeah. Giancarlo Esposito. He is a black uh, Chilean. Which is wild because that's like the one place where <laughs> it's like the, the, the whitest Latino. Yeah. In- <laughs> oh, that's so true. Chile is just, uh, it's full of like runaway uh, Germans <laughs> who yeah. are like, uh, I worked in a shoe factory in 1944. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was there in Argentina. They loved that. Yeah. They're like, yeah, I'm Polish. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. So it's uh, that there's a lot of um, Europeans in in Chile. But also, here's a wild thing. So there's the um, the native, the indigenous peoples in Chile and the southern part uh, around Temuco and further south. They were almost the last to be. Um, they put up the most resistance against the Spanish Empire. So there's fierce indigenous communities uh, in the southern half of, of uh, Chile. And then also at the northern end of the Spanish Empire were the Apaches. And they also were putting up the most resistance. So on both ends, the northern end of the empire and the southern end. They, they were had, bookended they by were, getting their ass beat. Yeah, bookended by wild ass indigenous tribes that were like, nah, we're not having it. Unfortunately, they weren't successful entirely that would have been, the world would have been a different place yeah yeah so uh so you saw in the heights and you gave it uh one love and one hate yeah <laughs> one thumb up one thumb down you pick up any dance moves oh no and i mean i was just amazed by how they had to sandwich in the song that's why i hate musicals because it's not natural at, a, at all it's just a bunch of people singing and dancing so everything has to lead to that so there's just like a break of a minute where someone's like, are you kidding me? Why would I uh, do that? And then they start <laughs> soft queuing. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, yeah. This is not real life. Uh, the only one I remember I, in school, I had to sing Oklahoma. Where the wind goes rushing through the wheat. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I know that song. Yeah. Well, 
Oklahoma, where the something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I went to an all black elementary school and it was wild to just have a bunch of kids that were never going to Oklahoma and never, it just had no idea what Oklahoma meant having to sing Oklahoma. <laughs> like I the love, song about middle America. I love that. I love the middle school field trips or elementary school field trips where they take you to erroneous places like, or that. Like they take you to one of those places where everyone is old timey, and they're like, "This is how people lived in the colonial days." Yes. And then like everything, they pretend they don't know about cell phones, and they're all like stirring, but like churning butter. And then you're like, "Where be ye slaves?" Yeah. And they're man. like, "Ooh, good. <laughs> what do you mean, dude?" This was so. I was at uh, St. Anne's Elementary School in uh, second grade, and we were doing the Oklahoma musical, but then uh, during the breaks. Uh, little girls would pull out cassettes and they and then they'd play uh, the Go Go song doing the butt. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so in between this like really hokey 1950s like white uh, musical, we're like cutting for our breaks to dance to Go Go music. I love that. Yeah. So uh, I love that Eric Andre sketch where he goes to Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, he runs around like a runaway slave. <laughs> <laughs> Never <laughs> then, seen it. It's dope, dude. I gotta see it. Because you just see, you know, a bunch of fanny pack wearing uh, dudes in khaki shorts with their families. And uh, and then, you know, there's the, the guy who's hired to be like, and this is where they churned butter. <laughs> and then you just see Eric Andre in the distance running, like, <laughs> with no shirt on, being like, Toby! <laughs> just some dudes running after him, trying to capture him. <laughs> So good. Because that's what it would be like. Oh, yeah. I've just seen him do such crazy things. Like, we were just talking about Cobra Club. I saw him roll up there, and they were waiting to do karaoke, and he had just literally gotten off, like, Radio City Music Hall and took a car over to Cobra Club and then jumped in and did a 20-some-odd-minute set when he was supposed to just do, like, eight minutes. So, uh, what are... You know what I've been thinking about uh, all, all week is uh the olympics oh yeah yeah are oh, you are yeah. you are you a fan have you ever uh wa- put money on an olympics <laughs> game put money yeah have you ever oh my God. have you ever lost take taken a bath <laughs> <laughs> on an olympic <laughs> like there was a shuffleboard <laughs> that yeah. i really um is there a shuffleboard i don't know oh um, god in the pole vaulter i put all my cash on he didn't he didn't make it <laughs> uh no i haven't but the olympics are a huge topic right now for a variety of reasons remember when they were originally supposed to happen and the guy's name was uh dick sweat or something his name was we'll find out but his name was dick something that was insane and hilarious and he was in charge of calling off the olympics what last year because of the pandemic yeah yeah well it's coming back and then uh what some some olympic uh track runner who's really good is uh getting banned for smoking weed right so she got so she got in trouble for smoking weed which they consider a performance enhancing drug and I, the only r- way I would ever watch the Olympics is that if you forced everyone at gunpoint to uh, get high before the competitions. <laughs> that would be amazing. And everyone's just looking around paranoid. Yeah. I just want a bunch of paranoid and jittery athletes who have been training and purifying their bodies for months or years even. And then right before the match, just getting a, a Dutch master put... <laughs> But it, are they? Are they have to wear those smoke this uh, the uh, gas masks with yeah, the, with the they bong extension? Bong? <laughs> they do wear a gas mask bong and then go do pole vaulting. Yeah, yeah. And then let's see if it's a performance enhancing drug, <laughs> because it seems to me that she is kicking everyone's ass with one arm tied behind her back. Absolutely. You know, and the wild thing is she literally, I think, even only smoked it because she was having horrible stress and anxiety Mm -hmm. and i think it was supposedly even just one time and they found trace elements of thc or something in her bloodstream somebody had it out for her somebody had it out for her they're risking an american gold medal over something that the olympics committee wouldn't even kick them out for right shock harry richardson so uh yeah man i think uh 
she uh, should be allowed to compete because uh, she's handicapped herself. If you consider weed to be something that's going to uh, uh, inhibit or change your performance in any way. Yeah. You know? She gave herself a handicap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which is just almost like a, a crazy flex if you handicap yourself like that. In <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I'm going to put a blindfold on my eyes and I'm still <laughs> going to beat your ass. Yeah. Yeah, I guess handicap is a bad word, by the way. Um, I don't want to get zinged by the woke mafia right now, but it's it goes back to um, people who are disabled would take their uh, cap off and put it in their hand and look for um, uh, donations or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, busking cell. And so... I don't know, you know, some, my sister is very uh, up on this language. And so stuff. she doesn't want you to use the word handicap. Exactly, yeah. But what if you're playing um, a sport where they talk about a handicap? Like when you're in golf, when they go, what's your handicap? I mean, I would just say handicap for everything. <laughs> I remember um, when my sister told me this, I was like, they better replace about a million parking signs. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So what is, she, what is her deal? Does she want you to say differently abled? Yeah, differently abled or uh, disabled disabled yeah so unable unable or something yeah well things keep changing over time you know i used to wear uh fire retarding pants yeah but you can't use that word anymore yeah now they're called fire challenged pants yeah 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 (laughs) (laughs) that r word but i think the r word also i think in in french it just means to slow Slow down down. to slow down so we also have to change french too yeah yeah we got to tell they're the real culprits uh, hey, French speakers, we need to have a conversation about the word you use for slowing things down. Yeah. So uh, that's the next tw- Twitter thread I guess I'll put out. Uh, but I'm bummed out, man, about this, about the Olympics happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't even care. I feel like I'm the somebody getting kicked out for smoking weed is the least uh, – negative impact that the olympics is having on the world the biggest negative impact is that it exists so like uh everyone in japan doesn't want it to happen in tokyo like they uh the people in tokyo are like please don't please don't have it here um because there's like a lambda variant there's a delta variant there's the alpha omega variants and people from all over the world unvaccinated are just going to show up and um, just create like this dope bouillabaisse. bays. Yeah, it's like a ratatouille. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be a COVID ratatouille uh, <laughs> coming out of Japan. And, you know, just kind of like a slow moving bio Hiroshima is what I'm expecting. And uh, it's bad news. And not only that, but when it, wherever the Olympics goes, uh, it creates kind of a real estate bubble mm-hmm. because they have to build all of these new facilities. And Instead of uh, 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 the government of Japan now has to put all this money into building the infrastructure for these facilities instead of dealing with things like the Fukushima uh, nuclear reactor meltdown, which is still an issue and is still dumping radioactive isotopes into the water and making the jellyfish and tuna glow. So instead of dealing with that, they've got to um, build up Tokyo, uh, push people out of their housing. Yeah. And uh, gentrify entire communities. And it's already extremely expensive in Tokyo. Yeah. Obnoxiously man. expensive. Uh, Japanese know, culture <laughs> is all about um, how you look on the outward. Yeah. And how you present yourself in society. Everybody's got to be a drip god. Yes, a drip god. And everyone has to flex like, and have a cool car and a dope watch. And like they're, yeah, just the drip god. And then they live in a closet. Sure. Uh, a tiny bento box. Yeah. Yeah, man. But it's a gu- Gucci bento box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, kitty. <laughs> yeah. So I'm bummed out uh, that this is happening in um, in the uh, in in Tokyo that that the Olympics is going to happen at all. Uh, yeah. You know what I was thinking about though with performance enhancing drugs. I don't think weed is one. I do think Ritalin is a performance enhancing drug. And I'm totally down with everybody who has ADHD getting Ritalin. But what I think is that the government should give every person Ritalin. Every child should get a 20 pack. (laughs) It melts children's brains. If you don't need it, you don't use it. 
But if you want to use it, you should be able to use it because it's unfair for some kids to be to get methamphetamines basically so they can stay up and study and get good grades and other kids have to rely on Bustello. Wow. Basically, I'm talking about myself. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that somebody had given me Ritalin so I could have competed with all the kids that got it. And basically, they just were able to get it because uh, their parents had money for psychiatrists, and allow, and which gave them steroids for their brains. It's an interesting thing you bring up because it's a short-term boost for sure, but children who take it, it warps their brain chemistry forever because mm-hmm. they're literally taking methamphetamines and their brain isn't fully developed. I know some people this has happened to who it really emotionally destroyed them psychologically and everything. So they went we from being one way Ritalin? to being completely... I mean, I wouldn't say that, but I would. I mean, everyone to each their own. If they want to use drugs and how they want to use them, that's not up to me. Because um, once they exist, you kind of can't shut the door on them. Someone's just going to make them in like a weird lab or something of their own. But I don't think it's good for kids at all. It like fucks their head up. That's why it's so crazy that they give it to teenagers because their brain is not fully developed. Yeah. And they're just pumping random drugs in there that is that are super dangerous to adults, even. Yeah, they should just give Ritalin to every adult that wants it. Now you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I don't know why I'm talking about kids. I don't care about them. I don't, I'm not going to have any. I, I could care less about the future when it comes to other people. But for me, <laughs> uh, it'd be cool to get Ritalin um, at this point. Because, like, what? I want, I want to read books. Hell yeah. Why not start seven businesses? <laughs> yeah. And when I see other people my age that have it, I go, that it just feels unfair that you have it and I don't. They always have a cocktail too, usually. They have, uh, they'll have Adderall, they'll have a Xanax mm-hmm. or Ativan for sure. Yeah. They'll definitely be cooking with flames on Prozac or another long term antidepressant, SSRI inhibitor or something. And, um, it's just like a starter pack. I know girls who have purses full of this stuff. They'll be like, are you like tired? Do you want an Adderall? Yeah. Are you, are you stressed out? Do you want a Xanax? And I'm like, yo, yeah. who are these doctors that you're just like better living through chemistry? These doctor feel goods. Uh, and these, yeah, man, everybody should, uh, basically if I was a, a petty tyrant, small business owner, I would only hire employees who I knew were on, uh, Methan- Ridlin. <laughs> yes. I would only, I'd be like, I'm sorry, have you been diagnosed with ADHD? Great. Because I need, I only want people who are willing to grind their teeth and work 48 hours a day for me. Yeah. Engage the entire time. Too. Yes. Yeah. Like smoke coming off their keyboards. Yeah. And you know, when people, uh, these drugs also uh, diminish empathy yeah. uh, over time, like uh, stimulants. So that's exactly the type of people I want working for me in a cutthroat um uh, sort of marketplace where we're competing against others is just a bunch of jacked up Adderall addled uh, psychopaths who have been drained of empathy. So 80s Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. there's just Coke. Yeah. It was Coke in 80s Wall Street. Well, I, I just read this book, Blitzed. Yes. It's on my shelf. You see it. It's, um, it's uh, Drugs in the Third Reich. And what's fascinating about Germany is that Germany had in the 1920s and tens they had uh the best um pharmacological uh, research and development in europe because they didn't have access to colonies so they didn't have uh, opium from the far east and they didn't have coke and co- like from uh, south america so uh the scientists there had to um synthetically make stimulants and painkillers and opioids so that's where morphine uh, comes from it's uh, bear yeah bear yeah. exactly and um the first methamphetamines were created in germany and they put them in chocolates and stuff for like housewives and little kids to eat so everyone was just jacked up on meth uh all this civilian population in the 20s and 30s and they were just horny tweakers like doing yeah meth. Yeah. And not even realizing what was going on and, then, and having no empathy for other people. Exactly. And then, well, that's so that that gets to the military applications. So if you've got two two armies and they've got the same uh, weaponry, the only difference is the human resources. So if if uh, the soldier in England has to go to sleep after 18 hours, um, if you can create a drug that enhances 
the other team, like your team, so that they're up longer, that army is going to win because they've got the same weaponry, but one, uh, but you need, so you need troops that stay up longer. So the theory in Blitzed was that the Germans just pumped methamphetamines into their, uh, pa into their panzer divisions it, so that they could, you know, ride for four days straight into, uh, you know, Russia and into uh, France. Wow. You know? But then what happens after that? You have they a crash. Army, yeah, you have an army full of fucking uh, tweaked out, like Breaking Bad zombies uh, who have no empathy. So... Yeah. War, shout outs to uh, war crimes possibly committed by people totally tweaked out of their minds. Yeah. And also they crash. So then they're like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just miserable. Oh, just grinding their teeth. Sad. Yeah. And killing people and doing horrible war crimes. Yeah. So um, anyway, what, what leaps we've made from uh, methamphetamines being created by the Germans to uh, Ridland being given to little kids to my idea of employers wanting to keep uh, employees jacked up on performance enhancing, enhancing stimulants. Yeah. They would if they could, believe me. Sure. I mean, I they would. would put it in the, they would put it in the uh, water cooler and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah go get some water. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this, this, uh, the Olympics thing again. It made me think about how in wherever the Olympics goes, police uh, repression also happens to uh, to clean out the poor areas. Oh, yeah. They're going to build the stadiums. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that, that happened in Brazil in, like, 2016. Yeah, with the favelas, right? Yeah, oh, exactly. So uh, have you ever been to Brazil? I've never been. I've, like, I've been desperate to go. You got to go. You yeah. got to go. I went, to, uh, I went on a favela tour, some... Um, you know, I think that there's something problematic in that. So it's, uh, it's like poverty tourism. Wow. You know? Yeah. But Like to go and check out a slum. But also, I'm of the mind that part of traveling is to see how people live in other places. Mm -hmm. And it helps, A, uh, make me feel like grateful for the things I have here. But then also, you get to see how you can compare and contrast you know, different systems and the favelas are, they're wild. So the reason that they exist the way they do is because they'll, it'll be like one long street. And then along the street, people will build their, sh it, their shanty houses. And then it's like their kids will build their house immediately behind it. So there's no planning or grids. It's almost like how uh, coral reefs form in nature. Yeah. Like one thing building on top of the other. Uh, and so there's just like these crazy chaotic mazes and walkways in between houses, all on hills. And uh, in the maps that they have of Brazil, of Rio, the maps don't show it like they used to just show, oh, the, this is where the city is. And then where the favela is, I put that in air quotes, where the favela is, they would just have like a blob of green and be like, park. <laughs> El parque central. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they don't show you exactly like what things look like there, you know. Yeah, it's fascinating because I remember that discussion. They were going to clear out the favelas because they didn't want that to be an eyesore yeah. for people from the international community to come, and then that's what they're left with: seeing the inequality, yeah. the wealth distribution and inequality in Brazil, a country notorious for that. Because Rio, for example, is in Sao Paulo, and um, Rio and Sao Paulo are both cities where there are people who are exorbitantly wealthy. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, they, they'll uh, the businessmen will take helicopters yes. from the tops of their office buildings to their suburban houses. Yes, yeah. absolutely, because they don't want to wait in traffic, and the traffic is obviously so crazy because there are millions of underprivileged <laughs> people in the streets. Yeah. And the same thing goes with Joburg. Like, when I went to South Africa, I saw the shanty, they call them shanty towns or whatever, same yeah. thing. And um, it was just shocking because there are people who are exorbitantly wealthy there as well. And then you have that. But um, going back to it, uh, Brazil is so fascinating to me because the wealthy people, just like every country we've talked about in Latin America or every colonized country, the wealthy people uh, never leave there. 
Why? Right. Or they do. You, I see them in advertising in New York they go all the to time. Disneyland. Yeah, or they come to work in New York in advertising, and they're like, this place is like, whatever, because where I live, everyone waxes their booty hole, and we're extremely wealthy, and we just live like the life of international traveling. Yeah. Like, you know. And so New York is even like pez- peasantry to them. And um, people are too equal here. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> When I was 18, I worked with Brazilians that came from Brazil to specifically work in construction and make a buttload of money and then bring it home and then live like a king. Yeah. That was their whole plan. They worked their ass off and they just stacked as much money as they could. And then they were like, we're going to go home. But they weren't living in Sao Paulo or Rio or something. They were living in the, you know, Campo or something. The uh, the thing about the favelas I found so interesting is that they're kind of walled off. You know, you'll have one or two or three entrances to get into the into the neighborhood, and when you're inside, it they are uh, like a <laughs> an autonomous zone. They're almost like a libertarian dream state because they have no public uh, facilities. The government isn't helping at all. Everything is sort of collectives within, you know, groups of people within. Uh, or you're just building your own house. You do whatever you want. There's no zoning laws. But uh, the, a lot of them are, are controlled by uh, narco gangs. Yeah. And, you know, people, like, there's crocodile tears shed over that. But Because I'm like, well, what is a gang really? A gang is just an organization of people who are, it's an organization that is not licensed. And so you can call any group of people that hang out together a gang. And uh, these narco gangs, there's one of them called the Red Command, and they started as a leftins- leftist insurgency in the, I think it was the 70s. I might be wrong, but they ended up, you know, their leaders go to jail, and when they go in jail, they start <laughs> uh, m- mingling with the other criminal elements, and they just start teaching these criminal elements like, like uh, more strict military organizational skills. So the fact that they put these gorillas in the same prisons as the common criminals just made the common criminals into like su- super well organized. Yeah, <laughs> teaches them skills they didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> like my man, you fucking up. Yeah, this is what you gotta do. Yeah, it was a great intercombio. Yeah. So now the Red Command, which is like Skillshare, <laughs> <laughs> they run uh, some of these favelas in uh, in Rio. And uh, this is the last thing about that. Very quickly, um, there's this anecdote where uh, the cops don't really go into the favelas. They'll have, like, one kiosk. But everything, all of the crimes are kind of dealt with within the community. And I, the way, the impression I got was that they were pretty safe. Like, if you're not an outsider, if you live there, you're safe because you're part of the community. But uh, there was this one anecdote where th- uh, there was a bank robbery happening at, at the one bank in one of these uh, favelas. And so all of the local gang st- ha- got into a firefight with the bank robbers. So the bank robbers are pinned down in the, the bank area by the, by the criminals, in air quotes. And it's like the Bank of Brazil is being robbed and the gangs are protecting the Bank of Brazil. And then they found out later that the bank was being robbed by off-duty cops. So the Bank of Brazil is being protected by the Red Command against the police. (laughs) I love that. That's an amazing (laughs) anecdote. Have you seen City of God? Yeah. Can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of it. And I think they did a part two. Sure. Yeah, they did. They they also made this really, it's a great film if you want to see how people become dehumanized and become like death squad police officers in Brazil. It's called Elite Squad. Yeah. Elite yeah. Squadrao. Yeah. I love it. I love to hear their language because I don't understand like every second word. Sure. It's like if someone got really drunk and then shot heroin and started speaking Spanish and Italian at the same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's like it's chopped and screwed Italian Spanish. <laughs> it is, yeah. Um oh, this week has been crazy. Uh I'm still looking for an apartment. Shout out to everyone who's been following the saga. Has anyone been helping you? Have you gotten any DMs? There, oh, that's amazing. This is an interesting story. So I'm in a position, which you know about, is isn't really public yet, but I mean, I've let the listeners uh, draw their own conclusions where I need a little bit more space than the sure. average bear. And yeah. um, 
Are you deciding to uh, buy a mini pig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Vietnamese pot belly fish. I, I can't. That's I'm like, I'm going to have my own chickens in my apartment. <laughs> have a chicken coop. <laughs> Boy, boy but yeah, so people will repeatedly send me uh, studio apartments and one bedroom apartments when I'm like, I need like uh, more than a two bedroom apartment. I need like either a two bedroom in an office or whatever. And people just go like, here's a good studio in Lefferts Gardens or something. I'm like, okay, like not the neighborhood I want to be in. And it's very, very small place that you're sending me here. Uh, did you see that the bathroom was a toilet shower where you shower above the toilet? Anyway, so there's that. And then I had this conversation with some comedians at a show and they were like, why are you trying to be such a flexor? Why do you need like so much space? Do you think you're a fucking luxury man or something? And I'm like, I need this space. And then I explain why. And they're just like, oh, wow. Okay. You do need this space. But um, I just hated you. <laughs> I was hating you <laughs> these past few weeks. Anyway, so back into it. Uh, the real estate people are such scum. Like, they there's a, all these tactics and anyone who's ever looked for a place in New York will know. And obviously I'd love your perspective on this, but there's like a few moves where a place will not be available. It'll have been off the market for a week, but they leave it up as a ploy because it was a desirable place. Yeah. That's the bait, baby. Yeah. It's the bait. So then you go, hi, I would love to see this place and only this place. Is it still available? And then they go like, Tell me more about yourself and what you're looking for. And then I go, that place is what I'm looking for. Is it still available? And then they go, first things first, I'd like to know who you are and like what your budget is. Why? My budget is the budget that that place was. So anyways, they do that. They waste your time back and forth emails. Then the day of you going to go look at it, they'll go, the place is already gone, but I have three great places to show you. So then that's the switch. And then they bring you to a building and they show you Freddy Krueger's boiler room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, only five children died down here. Yeah. And a man was set aflame. Um, I had a place like that that I used to show people on Greenpoint Ave. Uh, we all laughed at the uh, real estate office. We called it the kill room. Uh, <laughs> so it was like, oh my God. <laughs> it was four steps down. Yeah. So you're like on the sidewalk street level and then you walk four steps down and it was a true in quotes two bedroom. So there's like uh so you walk in uh to a courtyard and then you go to three more steps down into uh, a living room where the living room floor is tile and there is a drain in the middle of the living room floor like uh, that a butcher shop might have, because you know where you you gotta you gotta hang like the lambs hook. and then like a hook above it. slash their throats and the blood drips onto the floor and then dr and then pools in the drain. That like it was like that, and then there's two rooms on either side. So I knew that this place only a serial killer would live in this place, the kill room, and um, and it just didn't it didn't rent. But we would always show it to clients uh, at the end of the tour. So we'd show them the places we think they might like. And then when they acted like, well, I'm too good for this. We'd be like, okay, well, here's the other one in your budget. And it was like, <laughs> so we knew that it would never rent, but it was like to give people perspective on what's available. Right. And it also, <laughs> yeah, but I love that because then it all of a sudden, the thing you passed up, you're like, no, I won't have the turkey sandwich. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, here's a lasagna with flies coming out of it. It's made of dog shit. And then they're like, oh, the turkey sandwich looks really good. Yeah. And that's exactly go, what it is. Exactly. And then you look at your phone and you go, well, let me see if it's still available. Uh, actually, um, sorry, somebody put a deposit on it like 15 minutes ago. And now I'm upset with you as the client for wasting my time and not taking it. Right. And so then I'm you're like, there is that first one we saw where yeah. <laughs> it's haunted by the ghost of a man who... <laughs> Who used to fucking... Uh, that's what we call a stigmatized property. So you also have to reveal to people uh, whether someone had been murdered in, uh, in a house or an apartment or if it had a reputation of being haunted. Because uh, Did you ever have one of those? Uh, I never... Well, okay. So full disclosure to everybody listening, I have a real estate license and I was... Uh, a, I was a real estate agent who rented apartments. And when people think real estate's all like getting that money and being and when you are a, an apartment renter in New York City in the summer, you're a corner boy in the wire. Like I was on the block, you know, I was a dude in a white tee, you know, not higher up. 
Right. right. So, or I was an agent. And the broker, a broker is like the Tony Soprano. It is exactly like the mob. So you get a broker who gets the license. And then underneath the broker are a bunch of agents who w- are lower on the pyramid. And then each of them has to give a cut of any deal to their broker who doesn't really have to do any work. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. So that that's just a, they pass the money up like a pyramid. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's very Sopranos esque. Yeah, totally. So I was at the very bottom of the pyramid. But would you get a piece of whatever the deal is? Sure. So the deal is, is uh, I would show up on Monday, let's say, and there, my broker would have a bunch of listings and be like, here's the, the 10 apartments that we have. And here, and, and here are the keys, which they wouldn't even give us the keys. There'd be like one key and it would be on a hook. And then we'd have to run out and go make copies of that key. But you're in competition with all the other agents. So they, one of the agents will take the key and then like just disappear with it. Be- and then every time you text and ask for it so you can get access, they might get back to you, but they'll drag their feet. So you have no friends when you're a real estate agent. You're competing against your coworkers for access to buildings. And then I would, I would make keys, right? So I would like show up early, make 15 keys, then I would meet a client like you, uh, deep in Ridgewood. I'd show up 15 minutes earlier, or if I was lucky, and then I would try the key that I just made in the door. I still have nightmares where in my nightmare, I'm trying to enter buildings and uh, the key doesn't work and I'm locked out. And so I would have a client next to me uh, who's like, I need to move here with my family to t- yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living in a and car. You're just like, it's going to rain tonight. Out. Yeah, and we're locked out. And then they think that I'm the reason. And they think that I'm lying to them. And that I bait and switch them to show them this shitty apartment that I don't even care about. I've got no sca- I only make money if you rent the apartment. Right. So I would, like, let's say an apartment costs $2,400. And the uh, the fee is twenty four hundred dollars. Then I might get uh, half as my commission, which would be twelve before taxes. And then the other twelve would go straight to the broker who did nothing. Nothing. Wow! I gotta get a broker license. <laughs> yeah, totally. I like I go from hating it so much to being like I want in on this right horrible racket. So you get a broker license, and then you only hire people who are on Ridlin. Exactly, because you need brokers that have no lives or agents that have no lives that love posting because your job is promoting, just like in comedy, you you have to post uh, images all day long on Craigslist or on all the sites like Zillow. So you're constantly po- on Facebook. You use your own social capital to uh, promote things on Instagram. So you create a page that's like sexy, sexy agents with cool lofts in a uh, bed And then, yeah, so you're using your own social capital to, to get people to uh, meet up with you. So when somebody calls and they're like, hey, I just want to talk about my lo- Like, do you have this place? It is like dating. Where uh, I need to know as much about you as possible so that you're not wasting my time. Right. So I would have a cut and paste, like, 15 questions. And yeah, because if, you, called, cause uh, be if like, you go meet somebody who's just got garbage credit, no money, mm-hmm. and they're wasting your time, then you, that's time that you could have spent with someone who locked the deal. And I get that. And they're lying, too. Everyone's lying. It's like, I'm not a priest. They lie to you like they lie to Dennis. Like every dentist here is like, yeah, I floss. Like every single person uh, who wants an apartment won't tell you what their real credit score is, won't tell you how much money they make. Uh, all these things that are that are uh, necessary for the landlord. I could care less. Right. But like, it, it's like, the landlord wants to see like 700 plus credit. Yeah. And you have 450 credit. And yeah. I don't give a shit, but the landlord does. So I can't make the deal happen. Uh, yeah, I can't do anything about this. And honestly, no one can until we kill all the landlords. So uh, as long as credit, which is a ridiculous thing, uh, an adult credit, uh, an adult, um, it's like report card, your credit. Yeah. That matters. Like, why have we let, uh, these these credit card companies uh f- you know grade us 
The best thing is it's not even a mutual experience either because Equifax had that massive hack which led to so many people's identities being stolen and it destroyed people's lives and they weren't held accountable for it at all. In fact, that, I don't know if you remember, AOC was like, hit up their class action lawsuit. And she raised so much awareness about the class action lawsuit that it went from everyone was like supposed to be guaranteed to getting like somewhere around 150 bucks. But um, it went to people just getting offered a dollar or something and then they're like actually instead of money why don't you just take free protection of your credit when we were the ones who caused the problem it was insane and then after that expired they were trying to sell it at like something like twenty dollars a month or something for you to protect your credit because they fuck up that's crazy that's mob shit that's like it would be a shame if <laughs> yeah. Somebody burned your house down. Or Pay like, us to protect your house, or if, we'll burn it down. If you check your credit too many times, your credit score goes down, which is also, I have no idea why that is the case. If you pay your debts off too quickly, your credit score goes down. So really, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a dance. It's a delicate dance to keep your credit score up. Yeah. And it, it means so much um, when renting apartments. I hated it. It was the most soulless job uh to um and and i still i have friends that are like real uh, they're fine they're fine people and then i have friends uh well former friends maybe who who sell who are like buy sell sell places and they've seen my screeds on facebook about how real estate is terrible and they'll like take it personally and like gabe how dare you yeah you know i do this right <laughs> yeah and i'm like that's not dude that's on you man and uh, you, my opinion it should not affect your life. Like, if you have a clear conscience and you're moving through life the way you want to, why do you care what I say? You're like, wait, are you made of real estate? Why are you <laughs> taking offense? Yeah. Why, is your body made of bricks and mortar? Why is this your primary identity as, like, the dude who sells people houses? That too. Yeah. Unless you're the real estate king from American Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, and re you know, real estate also, what, what is the, um, what is the, the, the value of property actually? And what's that based on? So after I started doing real estate, I, I, re I, um, found out about redlining, which was a process, uh, after the depression of, uh, car, they would take a red, a red marker and they would demarcate on a map, the areas where, uh, the, the property value could go up. And the red lines, demarcating areas, were always based on race. Mm -hmm. So you have these places where um, traditionally, like African American or Mexican or Jewish uh, people would be living, and within those blocks, they wouldn't uh, give loans to small businesses. So if you couldn't get a loan as a small business there, then those uh, businesses would leave to other areas. And also, uh, other white people wouldn't buy houses in those areas because they, they, they wouldn't get a return on their investment. So that was the origin of the suburbs. It's like, okay, well, so we don't want to live in this place where we're not going to, where the value won't accrue. Yeah, I won't appreciate. So if the value won't appreciate, let's move to fucking uh, Levittown or some other nonsense place in Long Island. And but what's all that based on? Like it's artificially constructed value based on uh, race, sure. science. And you know what's even <laughs> deeper than that? There were some places where even though you owned the house, you signed a deal that said you would never sell it to a non-white person. Coven if, Coventry laws, right? Yeah, which is insane that that exists because I feel like just burning those houses down and being like, "Cool, <laughs> I have nothing. Eat a dick." And do it enough times where their insurance policy on, on our sin is just, like, too high. So it's like, what, are you going to build rebuild a house three times? Like, you know, I'm not going to be the one burning it down, but someone should. Oh, so here's a fun thing about uh, New York City. Uh, bit, uh, one anecdote about history. There's this place called Seneca Village. So we know where um, times, uh, what Central Park is now. Yeah. yeah. So where Central Park is now in the 1820s. When slavery was still legal in New York, so New York City had, there were enslaved people who were just walking around New York City in the 1820s. 
uh, there was a place where free uh, freemen, black black people that were free, would move to like eighty eighth street which in which is in now in central park yes so they lived there they bought all these houses there and not only was it a black community but it was uh there were irish and german people living there too and all the records show black and irish and um german people uh being buried in the same cemeteries going to the same weddings going to baptisms so it was like this uh multi-ethnic utopian village uh and then the city planners in new york said we need um a tourist attraction we need a place uh in the city uh you know for good pr let's build uh, let's build central park right here on this land so they eminent domained this um this community they just like wiped out this community that didn't fit into the paradigm because it was an unredlinable community in a way, you know, it's like where you have uh, racial harmony. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So, uh, in the same way that the Olympics today, uh, wipes out neighborhoods and communities for this tourist spectacle, Central Park could have been put anywhere, but you know, uh, they're not going to build Central Park where rich people would be, would be inconvenienced. Right. So they were like, "What? Where can we put this that will uh, affect, not affect capital?" And wow, like, that is so fascinating. Bowl over Seneca Village. Wow, I got to read more about that. That see, every time we do this, I learn something fascinating and new. You know. Oh yeah. Because this city is relatively young. I mean, in in the way that. Um, it really the turn of the the 18th century was when it started getting picking up pace you know if you oh, look yeah. at the old photos from like the 1930s even it's a completely different world yeah uh well uh central park i think this was uh, around 1857 that was the end of seneca village so that's probably when the park got started getting built um but uh the civil war is 1865 so they took a break for the Civil War. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're like, all you laborers, go lay your life down at fucking Gettysburg. Yeah. Whoever survived, you can come back and raise this village that exists here and turn it into a park. <laughs> the uh, But New York is New York was founded in uh, 1624. Yeah. Yeah. As I love new, how you know that. New Amsterdam. Yeah. The Dutch, man. Sure. That's why Ridgewood has Anker Dunk. Like, people would the dutch live there first well that's not true but yeah you know what i mean <laughs> the dutch came there and did whatever the fuck they did and then the british came and um they kept some of the names but they called that area ridgewood queens uh, ridgewood because of the trees that existed and it was on a slope a ridge so they called it ridgewood and uh yeah the dutch were the ones who started building all this shit on there and so it has been around. It's just that the way Manhattan has changed so significantly. Look at Brooklyn. Brooklyn's changed in the past 20 years. Williamsburg, down by the water, used to be where people used to go take a piss and that and get like uh, escorts to pound them off in their cars and stuff. And trucks would just leave massive semi trucks on Kent Ave. There was nothing. Yeah. Past where we are right now. Yeah, you could go down to the waterfront and just walk directly from the factories and warehouses to the water uh, through, you know, holes in the chain link fences if there were fences. And Smoke I just, rocks casually. Totally, dude. Just ro <laughs> just ro just roasting rocks, playing baseball. Break a few car windows open for yeah. no reason. Why not? Because there weren't any video cameras yet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So things are different now. Yeah. Well, good luck with the uh, with finding an apartment. Uh, my heart goes out to you, knowing what the real estate game is. Oh yeah, yeah. And you're you're just the thing is is that everything is so fluid. Like agents don't know what's even on the market that day. Like yesterday, I go to bed. I used to go to bed with ten listings, and when I would wake up in the morning, uh, five of those listings would no longer be available. Because somebody on Adderall, who was one of my coworkers, <laughs> had had uh, sealed a deal and signed a lease at uh, 9 p.m. the night before. 
Wow. So, or 10 or 11. And then uh, I would wake up and I'd get phone calls from good people like you and uh, being like, hey, can I see these places? And I would think, yeah, no problem. Let's meet at noon. And then we'd get to the place at noon and it was, and the, the keys wouldn't work or there'd already be somebody moving in. And then I would be seen as uh, uh, untrustworthy. Wow. <laughs> That's so ruthless. Uh, well, I'm glad you told me all this because I was just seeing to go on a rampage. And Yeah. No, I don't know what the, you know, what, what is what is the right answer? What is the solution? I'm very standoffish with them from the get-go, so I'm yeah. amazed that they entertain me. I go like, all right, I'd love to see this place, but don't try and bait and switch me. I don't have time for any of that shit. I don't want to see Freddy Krueger's basement. <laughs> I go down the list of like, I already know your games. Yeah. And then I either never hear back from them or they go like, of course, I'd never do that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, we're uh, uh, the, the agents aren't even the problem. Yeah, it's they, the whole we, sickness. Yeah. We're talking about symptoms versus the disease. Yeah. 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 So, like I said, good luck. Everybody out there listening, though, don't move to New York. It's impossible to find a place. At least at the moment, yeah. And if you move here, you're just going to raise our rent. So stay out. But I do know a boiler room with the drain yeah. that, that you can live in. I got a great. I got the the kill room is still available. It's been on the market room. for five years. Perfect. Yeah. Well. Um, oh, one thing we I've we've gotten some really amazing feedback from mm -hmm. uh, different listeners from across the country. This thing has been taking off a lot quicker than I even expected. I'm really happy to hear that people are listening and enjoying the show and. Um, We'd love it if you hit us up on halalcartels at gmail dot com. Um, yeah, we could even, you know, answer some of your questions. We're gonna do some special content for Patreon, so I'm happy, or we're happy to answer your questions or comments or whatever on there and shout you out. Yeah, and if you're in New York City, come out to Funhouse Comedy, which is going to be every Wednesday night at Pete's Candy Store at nine thirty, and you can catch Samir and I live on stage. And it's a showcase of some of our favorite performers in the area. Yeah. And like, comment, subscribe, review our podcast on Apple Podcasts. That's what we really want. Five-star reviews and just a couple sentences to get us bumped up in the algorithm. Yeah. It helps people discover our podcast. So if you really like it, that'd be great if you could do that. Yeah. Oh, and uh, you're, you're going to be hearing a new song on this uh, episode. So shout-outs to Serene Patel for... Uh, giving us the intro and outro music. Hell yeah. Shout out to Serene. He's great. Amazing. All right. We love you. Bye. Peace.